Hey guys, it's Kimberly from Keep the Tail Wagging and I am here with Brittany Young, the pet girl, because she has a puppy. So we are going to be talking about having a puppy, introducing a puppy into an already established pack, training a puppy, anything you need to know about a puppy, working with a reputable breeder, and then whatever else comes up. So thank you for joining me, Brittany. It is good to be here again. So um, I what made you want to get a puppy? Um, to be honest, I had something to prove to myself as a, um, as a dog trainer. Um, I have made so many mistakes in the past with our previous dogs. Um, and I just had all this knowledge and I really wanted to, um, I really wanted to have my second chance again or third or fourth, it'd be my fourth chance. <laughs> um, no, but I, um, not only that, I know the breeder quite well um, and they are, um, as far as like dog sporting goes, I really like to um, do agility. Uh, I do agility with my Shetland Sheepdog and um, I wanted, I was getting, starting to get a bit um, addicted to the fastness of agility and I was like, hey, I need a crazy rocket dog. So, um, keep, well, not to keep up with me, Binti's pretty fast these days, but um, to challenge me. And so, and it just so happened that my agility coach is my breeder. Um, and yeah, and the family of, um, the family of, I guess the, the breeder's name's Indian Oak and the Indian Oak family is really quite lovely. Um, and it's a little community. So yeah, I decided why not, why not get a yet another dog? <laughs> I'm so jealous. So, um, so now we know why you wanted a puppy. I gather because of the agility is why you chose a border collie. It's a border collie, right? Yeah, she is a, um, she's actually, her lines are actually from the States, Double J uh, Working Dogs in the States. She's a smooth coat border collie. She's her um, ancestors or her grandma or whatever. Um, they were cattle herding dogs or they're on a cattle farm. Um, so she is a working dog, uh, not your typical fluffy Border Collie. Yeah. Um, but yeah, she's Border You've got Border Collies, so you know. Yeah. Um, they're like, it's like a, I had a really big think about what breed I was going to get. Um, and having a kind of Border Collie Yogi and then having a Shetland Sheep Dog um, and a Labrador, I kind of wanted, I wanted something that was highly intelligent, um, super motivated, but also quite sensitive and loving. Um, and a Border Collie just ticks all those boxes, yeah. I think. Yeah, Rodrigo is a Border Collie mix. Well, all of them are Border Collie mixes, but he has the most Border Collie out of the pack, and he is the coolest dog. But I think the mix keeps him a little tame. I don't know what it would be like to have an actual purebred Border Collie because of that energy is just astounding. Yeah, yeah, they do. So, they have a lot of energy. When it comes to, <laughs> when it comes to um, choosing the right dog for you, what advice do you have for people on, you know, basically evaluating the different breeds out there and understanding what's going to work for them? Because obviously you have an active life, so an active dog is great for you, but it's not going to be great for everybody. Yeah, um, that is absolutely massive. So um, I thought long and hard. It took me two years to realize if I wanted another Border Collie. I looked at other I looked at Golden Retrievers. I looked at Nova Scotia Duck Tolling Retrievers. Um, I looked at Working Cocker Spaniels. Um, and I think you need to be realistic about what your circumstances are. Like you may dream of having a Border Collie and that's what you want. Um, that's what you want in your entire life. But you work Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, you live in a residential house. Like it's just not realistic. You know, we live on six acres. Um, I'm a dog trainer. I have a, I work in the dog industry. Um, I, I spend a lot of time at home. My hours are very flexible. Um, and I, my life is my dog. So, I mean, picking a working dog that requires a lot of my energy that's fine for me, but for um, a lot of people, that's not that's not suitable because if you can't fulfill that dog biologically, then you know you shouldn't really be getting it. Um, yeah, so I think it, people need to be really realistic about what dog they're going to bring into their home. You know, if you've got children, you know, getting a dog that um, is not good with children or that struggles to be, you know occasionally jumped on or bumped like bumped or, or something like that like that's important you know if I was in a family I would look at getting like a labradoodle or a, or a labrador or a golden retriever because they're quite resilient um, and robust and they 
forgive very easily. Um, yeah, so it's it's super important, and I couldn't stress that enough. You know, you need to look at all the negative traits of a breed when you look at buying a breed. You know, um, when I looked at a Sheltie, one of the traits that could perceive be perceived as negative was that they bark a lot. They're very vocal, so. I mean, I had to be really mindful that we were living in a, um, a residential area. We, at that time, we had, the day I picked her up, we actually bought a house on the same day. Um, idiots. <laughs> and it, I made that mistake. I picked a breed that was very vocal and I lived in a residential area with our other two dogs. And the reality was, is that it didn't work. And so within a year, we had to sell our house and move to acreage. So Miss Binty could bark whenever she wanted. <laughs> no, <laughs> no um, but this lifestyle suits her a lot more. I can't imagine her being in a residential home. Um, you know, she would, she'd go, I think it should go a little bit nuts. Yeah. But it's funny because we have that in common when we, the house that we live in now, we, um, brought home Rodrigo and Sydney like a few weeks before we moved into this house. And so on moving day, we had litter mate puppies. Um, thankfully, we also had a neighbor in our old neighborhood that came with us. And basically a few friends came throughout the weekend and just played with puppies so we can get the moving done. But it was in just like not well thought out, but you know, we survived. But yeah. so, um, now about working with breeders. So um, I, my dream of dreams is to someday work with a natural rearing breeder. But, and I know that not all breeders are created equal. And of course we live in a world where there's such, you know, really hot energy around working with a breeder and choosing a breeder. And, and um, how do you find a breeder that is good for you that would be considered a reputable breeder? And are you working with a natural rearing breeder? Um, yeah, so we have over in um, in Australia, we have, uh, it's a little bit different here. So, um, I mean, there are lots of things that come to, so I, I guess I'm a bit like, because uh, 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 I'm like, what do I say first? <laughs> so many things to say. No, so um, first and foremost is finding a reputable breeder. So my breeder is um, ANKC registered, uh, which is the for you guys have AKC registered. So um, all her dogs are pedigree dogs uh, and they come with pedigree papers. Now that uh, people say, oh, that doesn't mean anything. Blah. Yeah, I, I get that. But there's also testing that gets done um, as a requirement for being, or for having those papers. And um, my breeder has done all those testing, you know, hip and elbow scores are super important and all the things that are, I'm actually just pulling up. Just give me one second. All the testing that actually got done on this dog um, or got done on the parents. So, yeah. So, I mean, the collie eye um, anomaly, I can't say that word. There's like TN syndrome. There's like all these different syndromes that have been tested. Hips, pen hip scores um, are all super important, uh, you know, and all that kind of testing and understanding what all that testing meant and that my breeder had done this um, was super important. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that I looked at the structure of her adult dogs and the structure of the grand, um, the grandparents. Now, being a Border Collie, um, they can be a little bit straighter and like the shoulders in the back. And if you don't have any, uh, you don't have knowledge about structure, that's okay. It's not a problem. Uh, you could perhaps work with someone that does have a little bit of an idea. My breed is quite switched on when it comes to structure and she's not just breeding for cosmetic looks. Um, her dogs are all fantastic structurally um, and she breeds dogs that are, uh, that will fit the industry that they're going into. Um, and so, and she's really mindful and she's really objective and that's what I really liked. So having, looking at a dog's structure and going and having the heart to say that dog is not going to fit what I want to do with it or that dog's not going to be able to fit my life. Like for example, I wouldn't get a, you know, um, a, like a pug and go, I want to do agility with it. Structurally, it's not going to work. So um, having a look at what problems you may see down the track and if your breeder has ticked those off um, and covered those in their structure is really important. The next biggest thing that I, um, that I am massive on, like absolutely massive, it comes before anything, because um, obviously puppies grow and develop and change, is temperament. 
temperament is so important. Um, and my breeder gave me an application um, and I didn't know what puppy I was going to get until week seven. So that's why I, I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if there was going to be a temperament for me um, in that litter um, because I had written on paper everything I wanted in a dog, everything that I had you know, I had thought about and dreamed about and um, something that I think would fit with my lifestyle. And then the breeder looks at that and then she objectively looks at the puppies and says, after the temperament testing, what puppy would suit this home? Now, it just so happened that the one that I had bonded with the most um, and the one that I was like, that dog is the one I want, like she is on point. It just so happened that that dog ended up being the dog that I got, um, which is awesome. Uh, but you know, that temperament test is so important and just a breeder that lets, doesn't let you pick based on colours and doesn't let you pick based on coat. Like if you're going in there and going, I want the caramel one and you're getting a photo, you're doing it all wrong. Yeah. Um, because how do you know what that puppy is like? How do you know if you drop a pot, is that puppy going to scream and run away or is that puppy going to attack the pot? Like how, you don't know that at three weeks of age. You don't. Um, you need to wait till the puppies are like little dogs and have established themselves to know that. Um, and so that's something that I really valued in my breeder. Um, and then the other thing as well is that she was the first um, Australian breeder, as far as I'm aware, um, and there was an article on it, I might even send it to you. She was the first Australian breeder that sent blood away from the, the bitch, the mother, um, to see what the puppy's natural immunity would be. And so when we had to vaccinate, instead of vaccinating at like whatever the vaccination is at seven weeks or whatever, I don't actually have to vaccinate until nine weeks of age as the first set of vaccinations because we have the natural immunity there until that nine weeks of age. Um, and she was the first one in Australia to actually do that. So that was a big tick. Um, and it's just like little things, important things like that, you know, um, her dogs have all been titer tested. Um, I think the mother hasn't had vaccination since like, I think like 2003 or 2007, which is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I know the female bitch quite well. Um, I've seen her, I've interacted with her. Um, the dad was an import, so, or he's not, he actually lives in the state. So it was a... Um, you know, like the imported semen. Um, and I contacted the, the breeder over in the States um, with the other stud dog. And I contacted him and got videos sent to me and photos sent to me um, and got to know that dog as best as I possibly could. Um, and then the big one is that she feeds all her dogs fresh food. So uh, that was a massive tick, um, a massive tick for me. Um, and And yeah, I just looked at all the things that, I guess I looked at all the things that I wanted in a dog and I looked at my breeder and stacked them up. And how did that stack up? You know, she did puppy culture, which was massive. She did all the ENS stuff um, with the puppies. She did crate training with the puppies. She did clicker training with the puppies. She did, um, there's heaps of things that she did. You know, she had different noises in, in the room. You know, she had the, the play area was humongous. They were toilet trained when we picked them up. Um, <clears throat> all this amazing stuff and I picked that I researched my breeder to get all that and now I get all the perks and then when my puppy comes home it's like it's been easy it's been so easy and I haven't had any problems oh that's so amazing I'm I'm like completely and utterly stunned because I mean I knew it would be impressive because it's you but I that is like wow 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 and on top of all of this on top of all of this, I was lucky enough to visit the dogs from three days of age right through until they were um, going to their new home. So I helped with the puppy culture stuff. I helped with the crate training. I helped with all that stuff. And I played with the puppies and bonded with the puppies. And so I got to know them for the first eight weeks of their life. Um, and there was one more thing that was really amazing. She takes her puppies uh, <clears throat> at three and a half weeks. She takes all her puppies to, um, which is a double J tradition, which is the breeder in the States. All the puppies went to a nursing home um, and all the residents got to hold the puppies and tell stories about, and it was the most beautiful thing ever. Um, and she's done that with the past litters as well. Um, oh, wow. And it was just, just amazing. That is just like, I mean, it's so completely and utterly special. I would, 
none of that, all of that just stuns me to pieces. I'm like so impressed and wow, wow. So it's like, so that's what it's like, or it can yeah, be. Yeah, that's right. That that's is right. like astounding. So how was it, you know, incorporating your new puppy? And what's your puppy's name? Uh, my puppy's name is Vixen. Vixen. Like the, like the reindeer. Vixen. <laughs> I love it. And I how was it. it incorporating Vixen into the established pack? Um, oh, to be honest, I, even as a dog trainer, I was a little bit nervous about this because we have like a really good chi going um, with our group. We've got the three dogs and bullseye, the cat, cat slash dog. Um, and yeah, I was a little bit, to be honest, I've, I've had dogs come here. I've ran daycare out of my house um, previously and I've had so many dogs come through my house, like ridiculous puppies, older dogs, everything, you name it. And my dog's just it was just another dog to them. They were like, yeah, whatever. It's just, they didn't know until about day three, uh, we're keeping her. <laughs> um, and so for them, it was like routine. You know, I, I let um, a, a dog out at a time. Um, I have the puppy and I'm with the puppy. I let the dog, one dog come out at a time. Um, and I basically just sit back and I use my reinforcement and reward um, for behaviors I like. I'll call my adult dog off um, if I need to. Um, but they're all pretty good. They stand there and let the puppy sniff. So, you know, the process was quite slow. Then when it comes to integrating the puppy into our like into our structure, um, puppy pens are your friend. Um, I've just actually posted a post this morning about um, things that we've done in our first week uh, with, you know, having our puppy in our house and, and how to get a puppy used to your established pack. The trick mm -hmm. is, is that you don't leave your puppy with your adult dogs. Because um, like children, puppies are annoying. They're super annoying. Um, and they can be really overbearing. And so one thing I have done is I've made sure that my puppy, that Vixen wasn't left unattended with my adult dogs. Um, why? Because it's not their job to correct her every five minutes, right. um, for being pain in the bum. It's not her job to do that. It's my job to keep her safe and help teach her what's appropriate and what's not. Mm -hmm. I'll certainly allow, um, my dogs to like give minor corrections um but i definitely will not um i definitely will not allow um my dog to do any major telling off or anything like that um and the thing is is that you want a puppy to be set up for success right so if you're letting your puppy get to the point where they're totally being um yeah totally being uh, a pain in the pain in the butt um then you know you're not really set it, setting your dog up for success you're not setting your puppy up for success yeah. um yeah it's um i think as well too is that <clears throat> you if you start using a puppy pen <clears throat> people undervalue using a puppy pen as well it's, it's not just used for separating you know dogs and and whatever it's used for helping your puppy create independence and being <laughs> on their own um, so with Binti, I didn't really use a puppy pen at all. Um, and we were in between houses and whatever. So she spent time on her own, but, um, and she's probably the best, she's probably the best, um, the best out of the, the two, but for Tyson, um, when he had Pepsi and Yogi, he didn't separate them. So those two are inseparable, inseparable. And for a really long period of time, when we used to take one away, the other one would get really upset. Um, mm. and so establishing those boundaries nice and early that you're okay to be on your own is I think is super important. I mean, having litter mates is like a whole nother thing yet again. Um, but having that separate space for your puppy, um, is great for developing that independence as well and letting themselves settle and soothe and realize and, and giving them that needed time that they need to settle down and calm down um, and actually have a sleep and let their body rejuvenate um, and whatnot. If you just let a puppy go free for all, they won't stop. They'll just keep going and going and going. Yeah. Um, and that's when they make stupid decisions and <laughs> or, or I say stupid, but silly decisions. Yeah. Um, like eating my plants. <laughs> I saw that on Facebook. <laughs> the one plant she's got six acres of plants so what does she do she eats the one plant that i revived from from dead dying and i put it on my deck it's my favorite plant she ate it no <laughs> so um i'm assuming that vixen eats um a fresh food diet 
Yeah, mm -hmm. she does. And so do, are you making any um, changes to the diet because she's a puppy? Um, so I basically am using what her, um, her breeder was using. Um, she has taken to it really, really, really well. Um, like she's come into a new environment. She's not stressed or anything like that. Um, the only thing that I've added to her diet is Antonol, which is a, um, a, a joint supplement, um, or a joint, um, it's just really high in omega-3. So omega-3s help with trainability and brain development and brain function and whatnot. So that's something that I've added straight from the get-go. Um, and yeah, just just adding little things like probiotics and making sure that gut health is on point. Her poos have been really good, really, really good. Um, she's so regular. It's ridiculous. Um, and her, they're like, her stools are nice and firm and things like that. So I let that guide me along the way of what to add and what to um and what to you know add to her food but she's been she's been a champ like there's not there's nothing that i've added so far that she hasn't like chat like she's not liked or that she um yeah that she's turned her nose up or has not agreed with her <clears throat> but in saying that you have to go slow so mm -hmm. usually two weeks before you start changing anything so the base of her diet won't change it will be the same um for two weeks you know the the, the uh, commercial product that the breeder was using pumpkin um, and goat's milk. Um, they're what the breeder was feeding. So that's what I've um, carried on. And then I'll add anything only in very small doses, not even the maximum dose. Um, yeah. So, so she's, eating, she's eating pumpkin and goat's milk. Yeah. So she's having um, a commercial, it's a, um, commercial product that is um like the base of her food is a commercial oh, product i see it's balanced it's balanced to the nrc um afco mm -hmm. and to bdf um which is fantastic so she's got um she's got that now then pumpkin um was added to her food from the breeder that just keeps oh. her stools nice and, firm. and then goat milk um has just been added on top as well nice it's, it, all of that is so fascinating to me because I always get these questions about whether or not you have to change a puppy's diet. And I didn't change my puppy's diet. I just fed them exactly what my adult dogs were eating. And it, at the time, it was just nothing, nothing I considered because I was brand new to DIY raw feeding. So I was just mostly trying to get the food in the bowl. I think you just have to think about like long, like long term. Like I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't overwhelm the dog with, Oh my gosh, she's playing in a clothes basket. She's in a clothes basket. It's like tipped upside down and she's in it. <laughs> what have you got? You've got a sock. Oh my. <laughs> Bugger. See, you don't supervise it for one minute. This is what happens. Puppy pens, people. Puppy pens. No. <laughs> um, no, she, um, yeah, so... I mean, you got to think of what your end goal is going to be. Um, I'm always going to feed a varied diet. So that's going to be ranging from commercial or to um, ranging from commercial and DIY. My dogs will always have a mix of both. Um, they'll get air dried food as well. So making sure that as the, as she gets older, just sort of testing the waters and seeing and going really slow and offering those bits of, those bits of food along the way. Um, I don't really change a puppy's, diet the only thing that i am really mindful is that you're not just chucking everything in in a bowl in one big go um because that's all that change is going to upset their tummy you know like i added one day i added like three or four blueberries um and just watched how that played out and then she ate them and that was fine and her poos were normal and we had no issues so then you know in a couple of days i added um, you know, like a probiotic or a digestive enzyme or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but for the most part of it, you don't have to change your puppy's diet. Um, as long as you're, you know, you're not going too fast. Right. It's, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then finally, um, since you're a trainer and you're going to be doing agility, what are you doing now? Like in the first, you know, month of having your new puppy, what things are you working on now that'll get you to where you want to be? That's a really great question. Um, so for me, I've put, I've thought about this a lot 
um, and I've planned out what I want to achieve week to week with her. Um, the first week, she doesn't be home a week. The first week is about bonding and about establishing relationships and establishing the rules of the house um, and our boundaries and having so much fun while doing it. Um, so I don't t really teach obedience um, in the first like couple of weeks because I don't think it can be taught later in life. It doesn't need to be taught as a puppy. Um, as long as my puppy has good boundaries um, and is understanding things, I also think that it's important um, when your puppy's in its critical period of development that you need to socialize your puppy as best as you possibly can. So for Vixen, um, even though she hasn't had her vaccinations yet, I've picked her up and I've taken her to like a cafe um, where she got to see multiple people. She was exposed to traffic um, and like the busier world. Um, and around the home, because we live on acreage, she needs to get used to garden tools and um, and like mowers and blowers and whippersnippers and things like that, because these are things that will be happening all around us all the time. So that's something that we did this week. Um, we, yeah, so she is totally fine. In fact, yesterday I actually got the blower um, and she was following me around like a bad smell with the blower and I put the blower on and I blew her little face and she's like, and then she's like, <laughs> I'm not running off. So she doesn't even care. She does not even care. But that's because I spent time over the week getting her conditioned to what the noise is and then the noise moving with me and, and whatever. And she's totally fine. Um, getting her used to, um, I only will socialize her with adult dogs or young dogs that I know and trust. Um, there is no way in hell I will take her to a dog park and there is absolutely no way in hell that I will take her somewhere where I do not know the dogs personally. Um, why? Because I want to know that she's going to have good, um, purposeful interactions. Um, and so I won't leave that up to chance. No way. Not in a million years. Um, and I will only pick adult dogs that I trust um, to, to communicate effectively and that I know have good confidence and good communication skills. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I guess there's not much agility stuff that you can do. The things that I like doing are boundary training, crate training, um, it's Your Choice by Susan Garrett, uh, making the dog think and make decisions about whether, you know, whether they're going to jump on the food or whether they're going to sit patiently and wait for the food. All those kinds of things that challenge them to use their brain to make good decisions um, that are going to help them later in life. So we started working with her dinner. Um, we've, we've started doing that this week as well. So just playing little bed games and... Um, and, you know, crate games and things like that and feeding bones and things in the crate um, are all things that we've been doing. Um, but, yeah, no formal training, no no formal training until, you know, her critical period is, you know, we're getting into a critical period because obedience, like I said, can be taught later. Like a dog learning to navigate their their world and appropriately and confidently and safely, you've got 16 weeks to get that in. Um, so we'll just paste it out and go through. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Well, Brittany, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. I know this is super last minute and I so appreciate it. Awesome. 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 Thank you for having me. I love talking about puppies anytime of the week. <laughs> so.